Hello friends, now you will hear lecture delivered by Professor Rupin Walter Desai, retired from the Department of English, on Shakespeare's life and times. Professor Desai will also talk about political developments in the Elizabethan age and the significance of the Reformation and Protestantism in England. I hope you enjoy these modules on Shakespeare's life and times. Thank you. Welcome to this introductory talk on William Shakespeare. I think uh, all of us will agree that Shakespeare is uh, the best known author all over the world. His plays have been acted in all languages, of course originally in English, but in so many countries in translation adaptations. In India, we have both Shakespeare in his original language and Shakespeare in translation. He continues to be not only a bestseller, but also perhaps the most popular playwright on the screen, on television. And uh, in this talk, I'd like to introduce you all to various aspects of Shakespeare's life. He was born in 1564 in a small town, Stratford-upon-Avon in England, and uh, grew up in uh, rural surroundings. He went to London after he was uh, uh, beyond his mid-teens and uh, was an actor in London for some time before becoming a playwright, a dramatist. Let's look at uh, a portrait of Shakespeare called the Chandos portrait, most probably painted by Burbage, Richard Burbage, who was Shakespeare's friend, but more than friend, he was also Shakespeare's most prominent act actor and had a long association with Shakespeare. Uh, no one can be absolutely certain that Burbage painted this portrait, but uh, traditionally it is ascribed to him. As uh, all of us can see, <clears throat> Burbage has captured Shakespeare on canvas uh, when Shakespeare was still fairly young. And as you all can see, the artist has captured kind of an enigmatic look in the eyes, contemplative, reflective. Uh, perhaps the best portrait of Shakespeare's. There are altogether eight portraits that we have. Not all of them authentic, though like everything pertaining to Shakespeare, surrounded by controversy, by speculation. But this is the most interesting one. The next picture, which shows us Shakespeare's birthplace in Stratford-upon-Avon. And as you can see, it's a handsome house gabled. Uh, at the present, it's been rebuilt and uh, shows us that uh, Shakespeare grew up amidst uh, beautiful surroundings. The uh, row of flowers, the hedge in front that you see, perhaps was far more extensive in Shakespeare's time. But still, it gives us a good idea of uh, the kind of house in which Shakespeare grew up. Now, uh, Shakespeare married at the early age of 18. And the girl he married was eight years senior to him, Anne Hathaway. So she was 26. Now, this, of course, <clears throat> may seem very unusual. 
very unorthodox. And a great deal of speculation has gone into trying to explain why this disparity, why Shakespeare chose to marry a girl who was eight years his senior. Much of this speculation is unsavory, but it has no basis. Apparently, the family of Anne Hathaway was well known to the Shakespeare family. In fact, her father had financial dealings with Shakespeare's father, John Shakespeare. And uh, there is no reason to suppose that the marriage was a forced one or that it was quickly contracted in order to avert some circumstance which perhaps would have brought scandal upon the family. All this is speculative and I would like to caution all of you here today by saying that uh, a great deal pertains to Shakespeare that is not known. Three children were born to the couple, Susanna, the eldest, and then twins, Hamnet, a boy, Judith, of course, a girl. Hamnet died at the age of 11, around the time that Shakespeare was writing his most famous play, Hamlet, the tragedy of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. Besides his supremacy as a playwright, a dramatist, Shakespeare wrote several long poems, Venus and Adonis, The Rape of Lucrece, The Phoenix and the Turtle, and over 150 sonnets. So as all of us can see, he was a prolific writer and with an unpretentious educational background, this is an astonishing feat that Shakespeare was able to accomplish. This unpretentious background is also reflected in the building that we see here in front of us, a representation of Shakespeare's school, the Stratford Grammar School. And as you can see, it's a simple building, very difficult for us to uh, imagine how in such a humble structure, Shakespeare, whose genius is unparalleled, grew mentally, intellectually, and developed into the kind of writer that he was. Extremely successful, Shakespeare retired, a wealthy man, bought the second largest house in Stratford called New Place, made of stone, which was also unusual. At that time, most houses were made of wood. This one was made of stone. And it, it continued, it survived for 70 years after the death of the last survivor. It's no longer extant. But according to records that have been preserved, the house was very impressive, not only in its exterior appearance, but also spacious with a high ceiling and certainly was indicative of Shakespeare's success. Now this may be a rather uh, unusual kind of an equation, namely a playwright who did not have a university education and in a profession that was eyed a little askance. <clears throat> Let's not forget that theatre, drama, the stage were not considered to be highly respectable professions. 
the highly respectable professions where the military, the army, the navy, England's supremacy on the sea ensured that all those who joined as officers in the navy had a certain status in society. Shakespeare's status might not have been as considered to be as unimpeachable as certain other professions as we just now saw, the army, the navy, the church. And yet, Shakespeare retired wealthy to the extent that he could also buy 107 acres of farmland as well as a cottage <clears throat> close to New Place. So he was well endowed towards the close of his life. He died in 1616, was buried in Stratford. His tomb can still be seen. The inscription on the tomb says, Good friend, for Jesus' sake, forbear to dig the dust and close it here. Blessed be he who spares these stones, and cursed be he who moves these bones. So much importance has been attached to these lines, which might seem like doggerel, presumably written by Shakespeare himself, that no one has dared to disinter the bones of Shakespeare in this grave. Let's move on then <clears throat> to the next representation, the next picture of Queen Elizabeth. And of course, I don't think anyone needs an introduction to Queen Elizabeth I. She was undoubtedly one of the most illustrious and successful monarchs of England. This picture of Queen Elizabeth in regal splendor gives us a good indication of the symbolic supremacy that England had now achieved. As you can see, she's standing on the map of Europe indicative of England's dominance, growing dominance, and the displacement of Spain as the supreme power. We shouldn't forget that before the rise of England, Spain was the most powerful militarily, politically, diplomatically. She had established links all over the world. South America and particularly had been colonized by Spain. Enormous quantities of gold and silver were being <clears throat> extracted from Latin America, South America, and English ships were intercepting these galleons which were bringing back silver ore. English pirate ships, I deliberately use the word pirate and piracy because we are familiar with its re-emergence at the present time on the shoreline on the coast of Somalia. Piracy is not dead and the English ships were notorious for their plundering of these Spanish and Portuguese galleons. The Portuguese had already established themselves in India, but England was now challenging the authority of Spain and Portugal. And this portrait of Queen Elizabeth well demonstrates the grandeur towards which England was now aspiring. Notice the elaborate dress in which the Queen is attired. Notice also the elegance 
of her posture. The two arms extended, the uh, hooped skirt that she is wearing, increasing her size, her dimensions, and also notice the regal air with which she beholds her surroundings. Also, pay particular attention to the background, what could be flashes of lightning in the background. One side is light, the other side is dark, and in between is the queen. All of us, I think, can speculate on the symbolic significance of these artistic touches. All, in some sense, together, all taken together, suggestive of England's dominance, of England's supremacy. Also, let's note that the East India Company, which all of us know so much about today, considering the long colonial past that our country has, from the early, or let us say the middle of the 17th century to 1947, this colonial heritage that we have, which some of us might say is a blessing in disguise. It gave, gave us the English language, let's note that, which is perhaps today one of our most lucrative possessions. All of us are aware of this legacy that we have inherited from the English so that even though we may have mixed feelings regarding this historical background, it cannot be denied that today we have an enormous advantage. And of course, as you all know, this advantage is being recognized increasingly by all the states that constitute India. So much so, that the Municipal Corporation of Delhi is now going to establish an English medium school in uh, every constituency so that backward children might not be denied or deprived of the advantage of knowing English. And to go back to what I said earlier of uh, women in Shakespeare's time, not being backward or retarded as far as education went, this is well reflected in the fact that she, Queen Elizabeth, daughter of uh, Henry VIII, who, as all of you know, had six wives, not all at the same time, but in succession, she was the daughter of Anne Boleyn. Queen Elizabeth's ascension to the throne was not a simple matter. It was fraught with controversy, resistance. Her predecessors were Mary Tudor or Mary the First who was the daughter of an earlier wife of Henry VIII, Catherine of Aragon. Therefore, Queen Elizabeth's half-sister and her predecessor was Edward VI, who didn't reign for very long. He was her half-brother. Queen Elizabeth <clears throat> achieved great successes, not merely in England, becoming one of the most powerful nations of Europe. All of you have heard of the Spanish Armada 
and how England vanquished this mighty naval power of Spain in 1588. But also in terms of political stability, one of the most important achievements of Queen Elizabeth was political stability. England was passing through tumultuous times. The Renaissance came late to England, but accompanying the Renaissance was the Reformation. Both these terms are extremely important because if the Renaissance reflects the intellectual, the artistic, the cultural emergence of England as in no way inferior to, let us say, Italy or France, the Reformation reflected a break away from the authority of the Roman Catholic Church situated its headquarters, as all of you know, the Vatican, in which the Pope was the supreme head. Now this is an important facet of Queen Elizabeth's reign and requires careful attention. Today we might wonder why religion played such an important part in those times, the Renaissance, the 16th century in particular. But let's not forget that even in our own country, the demolition of the Babri Masjid elicited tremendous upheavals all over northern India, the repercussions of which can even now be felt now and again. As we all know, political parties revive the memory of the demolition of the Babri Masjid in order to achieve political mileage. So it's not anything very remote as far as we are concerned. And we should therefore examine how Henry VIII broke away from the authority of the Roman Catholic Church, established England's own autonomy, and how Queen Elizabeth continued maintaining this individualism, established the separate identity from the authority of the Vatican.